Welcome to our self-care series. Actually, this is a, a self-care challenge and it's really not a competitive challenge. What I want to do is help our members uh, learn about self-care practices during this um, somewhat stressful time we're going through. It's very important that we do good things for ourselves. Um, the theme of this self-care challenge is mindfulness, movement, nutrition, and simple self-care practices. What I've been doing is I've been bringing um, some of my friends who happen to be uh, wellness experts, I've been bringing them in our Zoom space and they are sharing information uh, with us all to help us stay healthy and perhaps achieve a higher level of wellness even during this stressful time. Um, so I'm so thankful you had the time to join us. For those of you who I haven't met, my name is Rhonda Jones. I'm the Mesa Health Promotion Consultant. What I usually do is I go out to school districts and I help Mesa members, school employees create workplaces that support wellness. Um, Prior to uh, COVID, that might look like uh, campaigns that would bring awareness to heart disease or breast cancer, or perhaps some uh, health-themed social challenge like a walking challenge or a hydration challenge, or perhaps even um, a lunch and learn, a professional de development day, or a workshop where I share information about fitness, about nutrition, and about uh, stress or mastering uh, stress and gaining resilience. So uh, COVID-19 has helped, uh, helped me find another way to deliver that important message. Um, so I'm glad I can say I'm thankful for COVID-19 for something because I am able to still reach you with this very, very important information. I wanted to um, remind you of some things as MESA members because you are um, have great benefits and we are very much invested into wellness and your health. And some of the things we offer, um, I don't want you to forget it even during this time because it can be helpful. Um, for our members that may be struggling, let's say you're struggling with your weight or perhaps the doctor has diagnosed you with prediabetes. I mentioned this in the last call and I want to keep reminding people that we have a benefit. We work with a company called Omada. It is a digital health coaching program for our members that may be at risk for diabetes. Uh, that means that you have seen your doctor and your doctor has told you that your A1C is elevated or perhaps you have people in your family that have been diagnosed with di diabetes, type 2 diabetes. Um, you've had um, continual elevated blood sugar levels. Um, if that is you, or perhaps if you're thinking maybe this might be me, you can go to our website, www.mesa.org, and you can um, uh, search our, the program is called OMADA, O-M-A-D-A. -A. Um, and what this program does is if you fit the criteria, you will get a health coach that works with you one-on-one -on -one to help you decrease your risk for diabetes. We're very passionate about helping our members um, mitigate risk factors that might cause diabetes because what we know right now, diabetes, there is no cure. But with a good information and appropriate lifestyle, you can manage it and live a productive lifestyle. So what we have done is we brought in benefits that can help our members mitigate the risk factors. OMADA is one of those things. It is free. Again, like I said, you get a health coach that helps you one-on-one. -on -one. They work virtually like this, digitally or telephonically. You also are put in a support group of people that you meet together vir uh, virtually. So it is a, a support group of people People that are dealing with the same thing. Um, they provide education and coaching to motivate you to reach goals within stress management, nutrition, and physical activities. Those are the three things. If you can optimize those three things, you can minimize most chronic health conditions. Uh, and that's why uh, we took on this theme, mindfulness, which is about managing stress, movement, which is about staying active, and nutrition is about um, eating healthy. Those are the things that help minimize your risk factors for um, chronic disease. So I wanted you to, uh, I wanted to remind you about those while I had you in our space. Um, it looks like we are almost at capacity. I am so happy um, 
today about our guest, Dr. Um, Brian Luke Seward. I met Dr. Seward um, uh, several years ago, probably almost 10 years ago in San Diego at a health promotion conference. I sat in a two-day um, certification on holistic stress management. And Dr. Seward is one of the, I'm gonna call him a founding father of a holistic stress management. He um, uh, teaches college courses on it. He does certifications for nurses. Um, he has worked with corporations and companies globally. Um, he has a textbook out there and I think he's um, editing it or rewriting it right now on holistic stress management. Um, and believe me, I've, I've been in one of his classes and it's not an easy thing to, uh, to pass, but he is the real deal. I was able to go out to um, Colorado, Boulder, Colorado last year and um, spend two days in, in the um, conference with him. I was able to climb a mountain and experience the uh, the beauty of Boulder, and I can't wait to go back. Um, and I will not hesitate anymore. I will bring to you Dr. Brian Luke Seward. Are you here, Dr. Seward, in the house somewhere? I am. Hi. Hi, Rhonda. It's great to be back. Thank you so much. Well, tell you what, let me, um, let me go ahead and uh, um, get going here, and we'll uh, share the screen, and we'll got some slides for you. So, uh, so there we go, and uh, let's see. All right, can everyone see that? Let's nope, see. Okay. there you go. There we go. Everyone see that, is that good? That is good. Okay, so um, so I decided to call this talk Staying Above the Fray because we have so much going on these days about uh, stress. So, uh, um, I, and I'm of the opinion that we can actually do some simple things to stay above the fray, but the, the key word here is resiliency. And I, I, what I'm gonna tell you is that a lot of what you're gonna hear uh, you've already heard before because most uh, concepts in stress management are based on common sense. But, and this is a huge but, when people get stressed, common sense is not too common. So let's begin. Uh, so uh, Rhonda mentioned some of the things I do. Um, I actually do a lot of work for WACO, which stands for Wellness Council of North America, and I've written some books for them. And so we have all kinds of resources which we can um, share with you if you have an interest in some of these, these um, ideas. Well, stress is the name of the game. And I got to tell you, I found these two uh, Time uh, magazines in the checkout stand in the past month or two before actually uh, uh, the coronavirus thing took place. And then, of course, we have stuff like this to share, uh, show us that we've got stress here on a regular basis. I won't bore you with the details, but a little bit of cultural literacy to kind of keep us up to pace here. So uh, just to kind of state the obvious, when people uh, our, uh, experience this, we have all kinds of things that come into mind. Um, things from uncertainty, which cause stress, disruptions in our lifestyles. And I, I wanna say, I salute all of you who are working in the, the school districts because people now are beginning to realize how difficult your jobs really are. I mean, it took a, a pandemic for this to happen, but, but obviously now we're seeing the real truth here and I salute you for that. Um, our world's become more fragile. People feel very overwhelmed, a lot of unease. And now what I'm hearing is that trauma is taking place with kids who have seen that their lifestyles have really changed a lot. So you're gonna probably hear more about that as well. Um, hopefully not, but I think you are. Um, but this is the real big thing, social isolation. And I gotta tell you that before all of this happened, um, last year when I was giving talks, uh, the two big issues with stress were isolation and alienation. And now we're seeing this forced upon us. So again, it's just another reminder about this. If you get nothing else out of this talk today, this is what I want you to know because um, we have a huge problem with um, a suppressed immune system in our country. There are three things, so I hold up three, four fingers, there are three things that can suppress the immune system that are pretty much uh, a given and very well documented. Poor sleep or insomnia, chronic stress, and poor nutrition. And I got to tell you, when I give talks like this, I hear people say, this sounds like everybody I know. So yes, we do have a problem in our country with a suppressed immune system. And these are some of the factors. And because of what's going on with a pandemic, um, I don't hear enough about how we can boost our immune system. But the ways to boost it are what Rhonda mentioned uh, with the program that she has um, uh, so wonderfully described here, but but we want to improve our sleep quality, we want to minimize stress, and we want to eat better. And we'll talk more about this as we go along. 
So uh, mental health issues are definitely the name of the game. Um, I just saw the slide on, on um, uh, social media. I thought it was kind of good to give ourselves a reminder that what you're doing for self-care is about mental health as well, not just broccoli and aerobics. We're talking the whole package, mind, body, spirit, and emotions. So uh, another thing, another take home point here, when I teach stress management, we talk about the basics and there are two ways in which we talk about this. One is to strengthen the structure. If we, we take a look at ourselves as a bridge, we wanna strengthen the structure so that we can actually carry a greater load, but also perhaps light, learn to lighten the load. And this is, this is a metaphorical way to describe stress management or resiliency. We want to become stronger and then not have so much weight. And this can, sometimes emotional baggage could be the weight too. So, but if you think in terms of, of uh, your own lifestyle, think to yourself, what can I do to, um, to strengthen my own structure, which would be things like better sleep, a better quality sleep, uh, uh, taking time to do some uh, meditation. We talk about mindfulness and also eating better. Those are things that strengthen the structure, lighten the load. Um, we could spend all day on that one, but I'll tell you right now, one of the ways in which to lighten the load is to listen to less news that is so negative because that adds on to our, our, um, our load. So a couple of things, some of you may have heard me mention this last time we got together, but um, some of you are, haven't heard this. And I just thought I'd give you a bigger picture because the big name of the game right now is how do we adapt to the times that we're in? And we're going through a huge change and a lot of people are saying some things we don't want to return to. Some of those things were not good, not beneficial, not healthy. But we can actually begin to navigate this. And part of this is going to be with adaptation. So um, you'll, you'll see where um, uh, Ron is recording this. You'll, you'll see this template that you can refer back to. But the first thing is um, we got to give some time for grieving. Grieving for the, the loss of expectations. I mean, some of you probably are realizing you can't go to your favorite restaurant anymore or sit down and eat. I've had that happen to me. I think we've all had that happen. Um, there's been a shift with things and part of this is we need to acknowledge the grieving process. Again, we could spend an hour on that one topic alone, but I, I want you to acknowledge that if you're feeling um, upset, if you're feeling um, stressed, part of this could be part of the grieving and that's natural and it's healthy. It's not healthy if it goes on for prolonged periods of time, but I just want to give it its due that it's okay to, to be upset about things because we're going through a change and that's, that's healthy. Number two is to accept what we can't change and move on. Uh, this is probably the big part of what uh, Rhonda's program is, is to stay grounded and to do various relaxation techniques and coping techniques that help us stay grounded so we don't get knocked over with the winds of change. And the winds of change are blowing pretty strong right now. There may be some more winds coming as they talk about a second wave of the virus. Uh, there's all kinds of things coming our way here that we may or may not even you know, be aware of, but, but doing things like morning meditation practice, even if it's for five minutes of mindfulness, to sit quietly and focus on your breathing. Um, some of you may do yoga, which is a great idea. Some of you may do um, uh, walks in the park or someplace where you can actually be out in nature, maybe just in your backyard. But what do you do to stay grounded? And another thing we could add here, and you're going to see another trend, don't listen to as much news as you may have been in the past. Um, it's important to know what's going on, but news basically has a fear component to it and fear is part of stress. We don't need to have news uh, all day long to see what's going on. If something really important is happening, we'll find out. But um, staying grounded is very, very important. And another word, the way to describe this is how to stay balanced. And if we have too much negativity from the news cycle, then we're not balanced. Um, access your resources. Uh, so what resources do you have in, in these uh, times here? The two big ones that people talk about all the time are time and money. But I think you're going to find out now that, um, that people are also resources, um, as are things like you can't really touch but are essential. Things like a sense of humor, a sense of patience, uh, a sense of creativity. Uh, we're seeing a lot of people taking up backyard farming now because they realize they got some time and they can go out and buy some lettuce and carrots and tomatoes and start making their own garden there. Uh, so what are your resources? And again, this goes back to trying to things that can help you stay grounded as well. Uh, some, some quiet time is definitely a resource for me at least, and probably we all need that. Uh, so create some good strategies. You're going to hear some here, some ideas. As with everything, when you hear presentations on stress management and wellness, I say this, 
take what you like and leave the rest. You can't do everything, you'll drive yourself crazy. So pick one or two things and perhaps uh, Rhonda and, and, uh, and uh, some of the other people who are involved here can, can put out this question to you when we get done. What's the most significant thing you got out of this presentation and how can you incorporate that into your life? So we can't do everything, but we can do a couple things. Uh, and good strategies, you'll see when we get to digital toxicity is, is gonna be part of that as well. And then next, evaluate your progress. How are you doing? If things aren't working, let's make some changes. All of this comes down to how to make a course correction so you stay back in balance. And if you get nothing else out of this presentation, the balance comes back to your immune system. How can we lift up, make more efficient your immune system so that you are healthier with that regard? And that's, that's key. And last but not least, celebrate your success. Um, so one of the ways in which I do this, and I'm not alone in doing this, is every night when before I, I uh, fall asleep, um, my wife and I, we, we say three things we're grateful for. And sometimes it seems like pretty mundane. I'm grateful that I could breathe without coughing today, or I'm grateful that I got some sunshine in my face. Little things like that, but we take so much for granted and we have so much going for us. And I'll tell you something I, which I, has always been a memory for me. I went down to the island of Dominica about 10 years ago. I was making a movie for um, the healing power of nature. And I met three uh, people there who offered to show me around the island. And I found out that they were dirt poor. I mean, they had basically conditions that you would think would be horrible. They were the happiest people I've ever met. And I thought to myself, God, I know people in the States who have all kinds of stuff, but you'd never know it because they don't show any kind of happiness. So to celebrate your success means to acknowledge the simple things in life that we often take for granted. And it may also be that, you know, hey, today I, I got eight hours sleep. That, that's significant. That's a successful thing to celebrate too. So just to kind of recap, this is a template for how to adapt in challenging times. And again, we, we start off with grieving. We get down to celebrating success because we go through the whole picture here. And we acknowledge the good and the bad and then focus on the good. So... That's, that's a picture I took last week. I'm only kidding. I, I borrowed that. <laughs> but um, stress is the new normal. I don't think it has to be. I think that we can navigate our lives so that we don't encounter stress 24-7. And so I want you to, to think to yourself now, yes, stress is part of life, but it's not every day that I'm going to have it be part of my, my life every hour. We, we can navigate around this, and, and that's important to, to do. Um, so how do we adapt to the new normal? Well, for now, we're going to have to make some changes and maybe there's some uncomfortable ones, but in doing this, we also make sure that we make a healthy environment for other people as well. You know, I saw this thing on, on social media that says, we stay home right now when they ask us to, so that when we get together, everybody is accountable, is, is accounted for. So again, some of the things we're doing, um, we may not particularly care for, but it's all part of being responsible. And that's part of wellness too, is to take responsibility for our own health. All right, so what you've been waiting for, what, what Rod has been waiting for is, when are you gonna talk about resiliency? This is the new buzzword in stress management. This is the new buzzword in health and, well, and wellness. And I heard this expression that says, it, resiliency are soft skills for a hard life. And I think we can all agree right now that we're in some pretty challenging times, which would make for a hard life. So uh, again, um, this is the art of resiliency, some, some things here. And I'm going to put it in real simple terms because I've learned from teaching um, adults, college kids, middle school kids, that if you can make a simple message, it's easier to process and, and, and take with you. So a couple of things. One is let's define resiliency. It's the power or ability to return to the original form, position, et cetera, after being bent, compressed, stretched, or basically to be elastic is what it comes down to. Well, that's one definition. How about this? The ability to recover readily from illness, depression, adversity, or the like, to be buoyant. And I hear a lot of people say time and time again, I just gotta come up for air. That's code for, I have to actually find some balance or be resilient with what's going on. So, um, what I discovered is that um, some people are, might seem naturally resilient, but we can all learn to become more resilient. It's not like it's a gift for a chosen few. This is a birthright for everybody. And if you want more information, you're going to see a couple of articles and books I throw up on the screen just to kind of give you some more uh, uh, substance here. But this is an article I found called How People Learn to Become More Resilient. 
uh, two books on resiliency and the one by Al Sieber, he, he's amazing. He goes to interview people who've been through hellacious life experiences, what he calls a survival personality. But he says, we all have the ability to do this. So if you're looking for some good books, I recommend those. Um, one more book, The Resiliency Factor. And I, I like that they talk about the seven keys because you're going to see shortly, no one's got the answer on what makes up resiliency. Um, I love this quote, it's by Gerda Weissman Klein. She says, giving up is the final solution to a temporary problem. Now, if you don't know this, Gerda actually survived Auschwitz and Steven Spielberg had the foresight to videotape survivors of Auschwitz and other concentration camps during World War II to tell their stories and keep the stories alive. And she was one person, she's alive today, she's actually photographed there in Arizona, uh, but she actually survived uh, Auschwitz and I think it was another, two different camps there. Uh, remarkable person, but I love her quote, giving up is the final solution to a temporary problem. Well, resiliency is the new buzzword. And whether it's in corporations or school districts or uh, middle schools, the army, you'll see it's used everywhere and for good reason. Uh, I will tell you right now that no one's got the answer on what are the three factors for resiliency, the seven keys, um, or the eight principles. And the reason why is that everyone's different, but there are some commonalities. Here's a picture from the military. I do some work with the military out in um, the Army and the, and the Air Force about how to try and have the soldiers become more resilient because everyone feels as if they need it. So um, one more thing I want to tell you is a lot of people think that resiliency is about being strong. This is a research from the Harvard Business Review that says, not so fast. Resiliency is also about taking time to quiet yourself down and recharge your personal energy. Now, I know we have some teachers in the audience here. I do some work with the school district in my town here. And this one gal who I um, work with, she actually has the Energizer Bunny. And she says, this is you. But at some point, the batteries are gonna die. You've got to take time to replace those batteries to recharge yourself. And I think that's an important message for resiliency. It's not just about how strong you are. Yeah, that's part of it, but it's also about taking time to unplug from the world and just recharge your personal energy. So there's a concept they mentioned in, in that article called cognitive recovery. And again, the approach that, that both um, uh, Ron and I take is one of holistic mind, body, spirit approaches. And that basically says a lack of recovery leads to an increased incidence of health and safety issues. We've got to take time to quiet the mind because this is part of uh, this uh, resiliency act factor too. There's a picture of me and my wife. My wife um, has Lyme disease. And after we, before we got married, we, we got this diagnosis. She was not doing too well. Uh, and she said to me before that we got married, she goes, if you want to back out, I understand. And I said to her, you can't get rid of me that easily. And so it turns out that um, the next year after we got married, which was three years ago, um, she was basically bedridden. Uh, not your typical uh, first year of marriage, but we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to deal with Lyme disease because she had a huge adaptation process going on. She had to monitor and really change her whole diet. She had to change her sleeping habits, change. She couldn't exercise at all, which was very, very frustrating for her. But here she is today, the picture of health. And I got to tell you that it took a while to adapt, but she will tell you that um, she no longer eats wheat. She no longer uh, eats dairy. She had to make some changes for her um, microbiome, for her health and well-being, because so much of your immune system is in your GI tract. 70% of your immune system is in your GI tract. If you end up on Jeopardy, that's the answer, 70%. So, you, so for her, a big part of adaptation was her eating habits. Well, okay, so uh, I want to share with you a real simple message about resiliency. If you thought it was simple before, it's going to get more simple. In fact, if someone says to you, hey, did you do that webinar with, with Rhonda about wellness? And you can say, I sure did. And here's what I learned. The three bones of resiliency. We have the backbone, we have the wishbone, and we got the funny bone. Now, everyone tends to think that this is what resiliency is, to be strong, to be secure, to really have courage and stamina and persistence. And yes, this is part of resiliency. And this is the most obvious, this is the most, um, uh, I guess, visual that people see when they hear stories of the triumph of the human spirit. Because this makes headline news. 
but that's not all there is. So yes, this is important, and we're going to have to have courage to go through the, the, the pandemic we're in right now because of all the changes. We have to have stamina for sure and persistence as well. But there's more. The wishbone, and the wishbone may sound like something kind of airy fairy. You know, I live in Boulder, Colorado. We get made fun of all the time. But it turns out that this is not um, airy fairy stuff. This is faith in yourself. This is faith in your family, faith in your higher power. This is also a vision of where you see yourself going in the world and then in the future. And also, I'm going to say your, your power of imagination, because this is important to help you get through. You know, they've interviewed scores of people who've been through hellacious life experiences, horrible things I can't even begin to mention, you know, like the concentration camp, like cancer, like amputations, like paraplegia, you, you name it. Uh, loss of children, loss of, of, of uh, spouses. And they ask him, how did you get through this? Because not everyone does, of course. Uh, some people claim victimization. But when they talk to people who are, I'm going to say, the heroes, they say, it's my sense of faith that got me through this. It was my vision that I could actually emerge back into the light, my sense of creativity. And so wishbone is inspiration. Wishbone is the breath of, of divine life. And it, this is so courage is important. Wishbone also too. And then last but not least, um, we could not talk about this without talking about the funny bone. I've looked at re people who've done research on resiliency and no matter how many factors or characteristics or principles or keys they talk about, everybody talks about having a sense of humor. It is what gets you through the tough times. Now, I don't spend a whole lot of time on social media. Perhaps um, you've been on there with Facebook or with things, but I am astonished at the funny things I see people posting. And it's, it's almost to the point where you think to yourself, God, who has the time to think this stuff up? But um, there's things that make me kind of scratch my head and think, wow, this is, this is a riot. And one of the things I'll, I'll see if I can um, share with you, I didn't think to include some here, but you may have seen this thing where people are trying to recreate famous masterpieces of artwork with what they have in their kitchen, you know, with toilet paper and paper towels and stuff. It's a riot, the imagination, the creativity, the, the sense of humor there. So funny bone is essential. And of course, we talk about to, be, to have self-deprecating humor where you make fun of yourself. Now, I got a question for you. How many times have you said to yourself, God, you know, a year from now, this will be funny, but right now this is not funny. I think we've all said that. But if you can take a moment to look at yourself right then and there, you're going to probably find there is something pretty funny. Don't, don't wait a whole year for that. Comic relief. And I was talking to my wife the other day about some of these comedians who, um, like Noah, uh, 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 Trevor Noah, who had a horrible life growing up, but he turned it around and found the funny parts in it. And, and a lot of like Gilda Radner, a lot of comedians um, have done that. And there are great examples of this. It also is a chance of perspective to see that, yeah, there's more going on than meets the eye. This, this virus is bad, there's no doubt about it. But they got through it in uh, 100 years ago with the Spanish flu and the, the, the 1919 virus. We're gonna get through this too. You know, I, I have Irish roots. I go to Ireland, Ireland quite a bit. And you know, they had a, a huge famine uh, over 150 years ago. And they still talk about it today as, <laughs> as if it was a living memory. And I hear this expression a lot by my family members who say, we got through the famine, we can get through this. And that's the idea about this as well, is, is we, can, we can do this with a sense of humor. So just to kind of recap, there are three bones of resiliency. In case anybody asked you, oh, you went to that talk on resiliency, what'd you learn? You can say, this is what I learned. There are three bones. There's the backbone, the wishbone, and the funny bone, and they weave together in a beautiful alchemy, what we call resiliency. And if you get nothing else out of this talk today, this is a lot to take home. So um, I like this expression. It says, resiliency is the health of the human spirit. And it is. It definitely is. Well, I, um, I, I collect stories of, of people who've been through hell and back, too. And, and there's a couple of stories we didn't have time for here. But, uh, but it's also resiliency is the triumph of the human spirit. And, and we're being tested right now. Humanity is being tested, but individually we're being tested, too. And, and we want to rise above. That's being above the fray. So resiliency is reclaiming your personal power. And what we see right now is when people get angry, uh, they give their power away. People give their power away to sports heroes and to politicians and to gurus. That is so 20th century. Uh, right now, we want to reclaim our personal power. And, and that's what resiliency is. 
Okay, so um, we, we could end there, but I promised uh, Rhonda, and she, she, she made me promise to talk about this, because this is a hot topic, and, and we could spend a lot more time than what we're going to have right now. I'm going to tippy toe across the surface of this, but, but um, here goes. So we lived in a plug-in society. Isn't that a graphic picture? Uh, it's, it's amazing. And I'm not going to tell you that technology is bad. I would never say that. I love technology. I could not do this presentation without technology. I cannot communicate with, with everyone without technology. But there has to be healthy boundaries. And that's what digital toxicity uh, negates. And that's what digital, um, uh, healthy digital behaviors is about. So we live in a culture of distractions. Uh, I hear this time and time again, things coming at us from all different directions. And you can't navigate your life well if you're always being yelled at from different directions. You've got to stay focused. And so part of this idea of digital uh, toxicity or detox is to unplug from this to give yourself a chance to catch your breath. So um, the research is coming in right now. You know, there's been a huge experiment with no control group about technology. That's been the, the sad part. So as the research is coming in now, they, they found that millennials devote more than seven hours a day to electronic media. I think that is actually kind of dated. It might be more than, than seven hours. Uh, children ages 11 to 14 devote 12 hours a day, always having a screen in front of them. That's crazy. And then Time Magazine said that 1 billion hours per day of YouTube viewers worldwide, uh, people just basically watching uh, YouTube videos all the time. So we have a little problem here. And the problem gets compounded when we start doing multitasking. Um, you've probably seen episodes of this. Uh, I live in Colorado. So it says in Colorado, 45 car accidents a day are attributed to smartphone use. Now this was before the pandemic, there's less driving. So hopefully this number is going down. But one thing I think we can change when we go back to the new normal is healthier boundaries with our technology. That is something that we can begin to, to take a look at. Um, and this is gonna be a mixed message, but if you get a chance, I would highly recommend you watch the 20 minute segment from 60 Minutes called Brain Hacking. In this episode, they spend time talking to uh, people who create video games and the apps for online shopping. And basically, they use psychology to entrap you to stay addicted to or tuned on to the, um, the technology. Um, it's a very sobering message that Anderson Cooper has about this. And I think it's just, again, just beware that, that these people make their money by you being uh, tuned in with your eyeballs all the time. That's not how we're supposed to live our lives. I'm not saying that technology is bad. I'm just saying healthy boundaries. So the research I thought was pretty interesting. Um, you get a dopamine squirt in your brain every time your cell phone pings or you get a text alert. And what they now know is that even if you think it goes off, you get a little uh, uh, squirt of dopamine. Dopamine is, is a neurotransmitter associated with addiction. So that's, there's a biochemical response going on here as well as an egotistical one. You know, the whole bit about Facebook is a lot of it's, it's ego. So uh, Susan Greenfield is out in, uh, uh, England, and she is a professor of synaptic pharmacology, and she says that by being online six to eight hours a day, this basically rewires our brain for stress. If you get nothing else out of this presentation, it's this. By constantly being on, you wire your brain for stress, which is why we want to have healthy boundaries and not always be on the devices. Um, so constant screen Gazing, surfing, and bait clicking wires the brain for stress. There's a term that you might want to know. Again, if you end up on Jeopardy, uh, it's called neuroplasticity. Uh, it's a, it's a, a, a big word, but really what it means is um, we, we rewire our brain for stress. And what mindfulness does, in case you wonder where we're going with all of this, mindfulness can help you unplug that wiring and rewire your brain for calm. And that's one reason why mindfulness is so big these days is that we see the problems with technology and we're trying to come back to balance. So when you hear uh, Ron to talk about mindfulness meditation, it's not something where you're going to shave your head and go to the nearest airport and sell flowers and, and eat uh, tabbouleh. That is so 20th century. Mindfulness right now is just calming yourself down so that you have clear perspective, not being constantly distracted. 
So this other concept you may have heard called FOMO, fear of missing out. The new one's called uh, FOCU, fear of keeping up. And then the research now shows that if you're always doing this, you're on a path to unhappiness. This is the antithesis of wellness. Well, another book, in case you have nothing to do but read books, uh, is called Irresistible. Adam Alter is a social psychologist who's done research about all this technology. And basically, he's got a couple messages about the addictive process. One he says is um, people who get bored can be, are more prone for being addictive, people who are lonely, and people who lack a purpose in life. This sounds like every teenager I know. So again, I'm not gonna say that technology is bad, but we just need to have healthy boundaries with this. He says people need to, to uh, turn to adult pacifier for addiction, and, and that's what they call it, these screen devices is, is an adult pacifier. So if you get nothing else out of this talk, I know I've said that 14 times already, but there's one important thing, and that is that we want to create healthy boundaries. Healthy boundaries is a message of saying we're not going to have this technology invade all aspects of our life, and that's really important. So digital toxicity is, is the name of the game and uh, with people today, even right now, I mean, we spent a lot more time Zooming than we did before, uh, but we can actually detox. And that's the message with this is, and take a look at some of these pictures here. The one to the, uh, the left is pretty graphic. I'll, I'll change the screens here because it's pretty gross. I like this cartoon is, I am not your device, you are my device. Uh, the last thing I want to kind of mention to you, uh, only because this is a huge problem, is that the bedroom is to use, be used for one thing and one thing only. Okay, possibly two, but technology is not part of that equation. So um, the, the National Institute on Sleep says we have a huge problem. They call it the invasion of technology in the bedroom. And the problem is that um, the screen devices affect melatonin production. And if melatonin production decreases, you're not going to get a good night's sleep. Also, melatonin production, when it decreases, affects your immune system. We come back full circle to that. So it's not that technology is bad, but you don't want to have this um, compromising your health and well-being. And so we want to have healthy boundaries with this. So uh, just a couple of things here. One is to maintain a, a, a media curfew. You know, I know teenagers hear the word curfew when they, they cringe, but having a media curfew is a good idea to say that, you know, after eight o'clock, no more, no more technology. You need about two hours of no lights in your eyes to begin to make melatonin for, for healthy sleep. Uh, designate your bedroom as a tech-free zone. Uh, not even the television belongs there. And this is probably the most important thing I can say in the whole presentation. I know I've said it about 15 times, but one more. Unplug your Wi-Fi router before you go to bed. And the reason why is that the Wi-Fi router emits a vibration, it's called the ELF, that um, tends to suppress the pineal gland's ability to make melatonin. And so you don't need the Wi-Fi router because you're asleep. So in your routine of locking the doors, turn the lights off, put the dog out to pee, turn off the Wi-Fi router. I put mine on a power strip, very easy to turn on and off. And you don't eat it while you're sleeping. And so this is how we try to aim for work-life balance. And with that, I will uh, turn it back over to, uh, to Rhonda. Thanks, Rhonda. Thank you, that was fabulous. Um, there's a couple questions in the chat, if you don't mind. Yeah, please, go ahead. Um, Wendy is wondering, uh, she's concerned about the, uh, about the information you shared and the amount of time that has to be spent with technology now that we are, are doing virtual school and virtual lessons. Um, is there anything, the first thing that comes to me is balance, but what do you say about that? Yeah, I would say try to designate some time in your life without technology. You know, go, if you can, go for a walk outside. Uh, the backyard without your cell phone. Uh, meditation, mindfulness, as we talked about, is important there too. Yes, I'm not saying don't have technology, and I, under, I agree with you that now we're telling everyone, you know, oh, don't forget your Zoom class and, and online uh, classes for, uh, for, for students. I understand that it's a mixed message, but all I'm saying is that have scheduled time in your day where there's no technology, and also Healthy Boundaries says to communicate with your family and friends, these are the times you can't reach me. Okay, I'm not gonna have my cell phone turned on. I am not gonna answer text. This is the time you can't reach me because I need to have time to recharge my personal energy. 
And they're going to, first they're going to say, what? But I'll tell you something. There's a quote from Gandhi who says, first they ridicule you, then they ignore you, and then they accept you. And the first time you say this, when you put down a healthy boundary, they're going to say, who are you? You know, what's going on here? And because they've been walking all over you in the past, I don't know how many months or years or whatever, make sure they can always text you and always get you to text back. Now you have healthy boundaries so that you don't get walked over. There's, in simple terms, there's three kinds of behavior, passive, aggressive, and assertive. You are being assertive to so say, do not enter right now. So uh, it's not that we're gonna get rid of technology, I'm not saying that, but to have designated times in the course of your day where there is no technology. One being the dinner table. I think we can all agree on that one. Um, and then also, I would say, uh, don't turn your Wi-Fi back on until after you've had a shower. You know, if you turn it off at nighttime, have a morning routine where the first thing you do is not look at your computer screen. You know, uh, take a shower, meditate, and then turn on the, the Wi-Fi router. And it, yeah, it's, a, it's a habit. All of these are habits. The more you practice, the better you become at them. Yes, great. Thank you. And and I'd add to that, uh, because we have to be exposed to so much technology, um, I'm trying to be even more intentional about doing those things that you've mentioned, getting good sleep, um, meditating, practicing mindfulness, good nutrition, and uh, make sure I'm, I'm being active. Because often the technology I can't control because that's my job now, but I can make sure I'm doing all the other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Let's see, um, any other questions in here? Somebody is uh, recommending the Calm app for meditation. Yes, that is a great app. And I believe at one time they had a discount for school employees. It seems like, is there a healthy amount of time to be on your computer or electronic devices? You kind of answered that. Yeah, well, they're saying that uh, the eight hours is too much. Um, so um, I would, you know, as much as I think it's great, I've written books. I think it's great to have a book on a, on a device like a, a Kindle or whatever. It's not a bad idea to go back. Some of the stuff we had in the 20th century was pretty good, you know, like books to hold in your hand. One thing I'll tell you that people who read and bend with their devices, that light comes into your eyes, to the pineal gland, and this is what really throws off um, your, your uh, brain chemistry. So. Um, I would say do not bring devices to bed. Again, the, 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 zo the bed free, the bed zone, the bedroom is a, a tech free zone, as they say. Yes. Um, someone um, mentioned the book, the book Dr. Seward wrote um, that we have at Mesa is called Getting a Good Night's Sleep. He, he, you showed yep. that on the PowerPoint. I have those available. Um, if you email me at healthy at mesa.org, I can get um, one of those books to you. I usually bring them out when I come out and do lunch and learn sessions. Um, there's only certain days I'm able to get to the office and get anything out though. So it'll kind of be, um, take a little bit of time, but let me know um, at healthyatmesa.org. I can get both of those books for you. The one is on getting a good night's sleep and the other one, Dr. Seward, is uh, your road to wellness, correct? Wellness, yep, uh -huh, yep. Yeah. And, and no, Dr. Seward, I take those books uh, with me wherever I go and I give them out um, to our school employees. Let's see, anything else out there in the virtual world? I'm so glad to see everybody. Thank you for coming again and spending your lunchtime with us. Use this information. Um, it is very, very important and it's very, very effective. It works when you work it. When you do it, it does help. It helps support your wellness. Thank you for all the compliments. We'll be back in this space next week, um, again, with some more information on mindfulness, movement, and nutrition, and supporting your well-being. Mesa, uh, we are um, very, very, very dedicated to your wellness. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Seward. Hey, thanks, Ryan. Good to see you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you.